So I'm going to introduce our patient keynote, Amy Tendrick, this morning. Uh, but before I do that, I, I, I'm Deb Kilpatrick, by the way. I rudely did not introduce myself. Um, uh, I think people are aware, Amy and I were co-founders of, of MedTech Vision, and we are thrilled to be doing this and see this room filled. Um, a lot of people are asking why it's not the Rosewood. There's a long story behind that. We'll talk about that later, maybe in a break. Um, but I also want to thank uh, each of you who are choosing to come back every year. Uh, we've got a lot of alumni. And in fact, several of those people who did not get Johnny on the spot on registration this year emailed me at the 11th hour begging to get a spot to this, uh, claiming that they deserved a spot because they'd come every year. And couldn't I just give them one of my extra tickets? And I said, you know, I don't, I don't get no extra tickets. Uh, they don't let me have anything like that. Uh, so there are a lot of people that were on the waiting list, which was growing by every day. So thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back and, and participating in what we think is a pretty, pretty important day. Um, I also want to publicly thank Amy uh, for doing this. Um, I, I do often say, in fact, I. <laughs> As, as Amy can tell you, uh, one of the things I talk about and I've often talked about in, in, in my staff meetings um, is, you know, great ideas are great ideas. Great ideas are fairly equally distributed among any population, but success is biased towards those who execute. And uh, it was a great idea, and you get a lot of credit for that, but uh, having activated that and gr brought a group of people together to activate it and then further activated it among all the people that are coming every year, it's just... It's different, and it's special, and so thank you for, for doing that. Um, Amy Tenderick was our pa patient keynote this year, and we thought that for our patient keynote this year, we really wanted somebody who obviously was a patient, uh, and she qualifies as type a type 1 diabetes patient. Um, but more importantly, somebody who really was picking up the, uh, the gavel of patient-centered design. Uh, and having a voice in med tech that was really changing things in a way that we felt was notable and arguably revolutionary. And I think Amy qualifies as that. Um, she's the founder and editor-in-chief of Diabetes Mind. For those of you who may be diabetic, you may already know a lot about Diabetes Mind. For those of you who don't, um, I'll tell you that it's one of the top health blogs around the country and considered one of the top health blogs in the whole world um, and is the leading destination for patients with diabetes. Um, it's now part of San Francisco-based Healthline Networks, and so Amy Tendrick is now uh, the Editorial Director for Diabetes and Patient Advocacy at Healthline here in San Francisco. Um, my, my, favorite, my favorite part of her story, and I know she's going to talk about this, so I won't steal the thunder, but um, is this open letter to Steve Jobs that she wrote in 2007, essentially demanding and pleading really, that the consumer tech uh, design sense um, that so many of us recognize uh, with Apple and other consumer tech products really start to be applied towards med tech products. Um, and having uh, all of us, I think, in the room been in med tech for a number of years, including around that time, I think we can all cop to the fact that we really didn't think about it that way. Um, in fact, when we started med tech vision, one of the at the time, fairly radical things we wanted to do was we were looking at the agenda and how we would do this. We would kick off every year with a patient keynote. And every year I tell this to our patient keynotes and they're, they're stymied, they're flummoxed that, what do you mean, this doesn't always happen? And we're like, no, it, it doesn't. It's more common now, but it was pretty rare uh, to non-existent f even five years ago. And we wanted to do that because A, it sets a tone. Uh, but more importantly, B, it reminds us why we're all doing healthcare as our career. Because healthcare is not easy, right? It's heavily regulated for good reason. It's very fragmented for lots of reasons that, that well, probably will be talked about today. Um, it's complicated. It's fraught with risk for good reason when it comes to the fact that, you know, we're trying to prove clinical impact and efficacy and safety profiles of new things to be used in patients. Uh, but ironically, we really didn't talk about patients as the user, we talked about providers as being the recipient and user and decider of our technologies. And that, I think that's, that's shifting a lot, shifted a lot, but what Amy's done and she'll talk about is made that conversation very broad, very big, and very real, uh, particularly in the type 1 diabetic community, um, which arguably is one of the most important communities to have that conversation uh, germinate, for, germinate from. So 
Without further ado, uh, I invite Amy to come here and talk about her experience and what she's doing at Diabetes Mine and kick us off for MedTech Vision 2015. So thank you so much for having me, and I do think it is so forward-thinking to start the day with a patient. I so appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk to you about the rise of patient-centered innovation, which has sort of taken over my life. <laughs> but I want to start with um, showing you an image. Um, I don't know if any of you will recognize what this is, but to me this really illustrates the relationship that we are having these days with medical devices. People are literally creating art out of them. There are whole exhibitions and uh, groups on Flickr and websites where people are, um, you know, sort of expressing their 24-7 relationship with these technologies in new ways. And just by contrast, um, this is the marketing photo of the, the product that you just saw. It looks all nice and packaged and it's shiny. It looks like something you, you know, you want to buy and it's going to come out of the box and be all nice and neat and, and sort of solve some problem in your life, which it sort of does. But uh, on the other hand, the reality, and this is the same product, the reality of these things is actually quite messy. So, you know, despite the, the work that's been done um, to make this easy to insert, it's still not easy to insert. It's still painful. You still have to buy extra accessories so that you can carry the receiver around. This is a continuous glucose monitor, by the way, which I wear 24-7 myself. Um, you know, you have to carry this thing around that's showing you numbers all the time, constantly reminding you, constantly sort of shiting you for, you know, not doing a good job. You feel like you're constantly being judged. And on top of that, um, there are things that people never tell you, like all the skin irritations that come along with wearing a medical device 24-7, trying to find a place to put it, having to purchase additional adhesives, and then getting irritate, you know, irritated by those, and you know, awkward places to, to insert it. And in fact, these things aren't very aesthetic. They do look pretty hospitalish still. So there's a whole movement of people sort of decorating their medical devices. And in the corner, you can see a young girl has bejeweled hers. <laughs> So um, this, is, this is sort of the space that I live in, is kind of the gap between the picture I just showed you, uh, you know, this pretty packaged, marketed product, and what's going on out in the real world with people living with these devices and, you know, whose lives depend on them. And this, by the way, is my street cred. This is me. Um, I, the thing you see, um, the small thing is the continuous glucose monitor that you just saw, and the other one is, um, some people here were familiar with it, Insulet's... Uh, Omnipod, which is a tubeless insulin pump, which is fantastic because I don't have to wear tubing hanging off me, but it's still uh, somewhat uncomfortable and has, it brings with it all the problems that I just showed you. So um, take a moment to introduce myself. Um, Amy Tenderich, uh, I began Diabetes Mine as my own personal blog in uh, 2005, so just shortly after I had been diagnosed with um, type 1 diabetes myself and it's sort of grown into this sort of uh, information resource and sort of networking place for all sorts of people affected by diabetes. So patients, caregivers, a lot of people in the industry. Um, and as mentioned, uh, we joined the, so the website was acquired by Healthline Networks in January of this year. So I'm now an employee of, of Healthline, but I also still run my own consultancy on the side. And the events that I do are um, still owned and operated by my consultancy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, I do uh, you know, a lot of speaking. I had uh, co-authored a book about diabetes, which really just helped sort of put me on the map as a person, um, you know, forefront of the, of the e-patient revolution, a place that I'm very happy to be. Um, so this is what my children look like the year that I was diagnosed. Um, I had just given birth to my third child and suddenly started losing weight like crazy. Um, so you can see they're about to break her head off. There, <laughs> you know, it requires some supervision, adult supervision required. Um, uh, but um, basically what happened was, boy, I just started losing weight like crazy um, to the point where I would get up in the morning and I was skinnier than I was the day before. And I knew something was wrong. <laughs> That's not normal. And so my husband just freaked out on me and said, you need to go to the doctor. And P.S., um, I ended up in the hospital for a week, which was pretty miserable because I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a five-month-old baby at home. And I actually went there at night to the emergency room because they had called me and said, your blood sugar is so high, you're about to go into a coma. I said, well, I think I'm okay. I just feel really jittery, and my contact lenses are terrible. I can't see anything, <laughs> you know, because you have this blurred vision. So, um, you know, they rubber stamped me as type 2 diabetic because of my age. I was 37. And even I knew that something wasn't right with that because I looked like I had just been liberated from a concentration camp. 
And I thought, this doesn't seem right. And so soon found out that I had type 1, which used to be called juvenile diabetes, and feeling like the only adult on the planet who would ever get this disease. And they had me on far too much insulin in the beginning. It was all just guesswork. So I was having hypoglycemic events two and three times a day. I thought I was having a nervous breakdown, honestly, um, because it's, I was so such an unfamiliar feeling, and it came on so strong, and I was afraid to get in the car with my children. I, would, I, was, I felt like I couldn't take care of my family, and this, this was just miserable. And um, so about a year into this of just being absolutely miserable, spending a couple days on the couch crying, I kind of got up and said, okay, they're not going to help. These doctors aren't helping me. I need to figure this out. So that's where I really went to the internet and started, you know, Googling things and you look something up, you know, diabetes foot care and you get 1.4 million hits and you just go, oh, you know, what do I do with this? So, you know, that was really the impetus for me to create the site that I had hoped to find and try to connect with other patients in the real world. And, um, you know, it's been quite a journey. And this is, I just want to show you, this is what my family looks like today. And um, I'm very proud to say that I think my three daughters have gotten a lot out of me being the diabetes lady while they're growing up. You know, because some people worry about, oh, my, you know, their children being sort of traumatized by them having an illness. But I actually think they've become very, you know, empathetic and they're very aware of health and what's going on around them. So, you know, and, and I do want to point out that women are overrepresented in the area of e-patient uh, advocacy and patient entrepreneurship. And, you know, you can ask, well, so why is that? Maybe it's the caregiver instinct, you know, the sort of obvious thing, intrinsic empathy for other people. But, you know, they say women are the CEO of the home. But I also think that it's part, partly because we're in this sort of collaborative, social, networked world now that plays to women's strength. And, you know, the sharing economy, I think, is, is very suited to women's strengths. So um, I'm very excited for my daughters for their future. So again, this is what Diabetes Mind looks like now, um, as, now that we joined Healthline Networks. It, we call it a diabetes newspaper with a personal twist. So it's all, um, you know, we cover a lot of news. We're very technology focused because I actually have a background as a technology journalist. That's what I was doing before I got diagnosed um, here in the Valley as a freelance uh, technology journalist. So I was just fascinated by all of, all of the gadgets and now, of course, the apps and whatnot. But we also do feature stories, book reviews, um, just all kinds of things. We post poems about diabetes a little bit of everything. And again, we have a big following also in the industry because we, we try to kind of look behind the headlines and you know, help people sort out what's real. And we also kind of uh, we, uh, you know, get the skinny a lot of times on which companies are collaborating, what they're doing, and try to kind of, you know, again, look behind the scenes a bit for patients. And I'm very proud to say, again, that you know, I was fortunate to be diagnosed at the time, the birth of social media, and then I was able to create this voice and reach out to people across the country and around the world. And um, you know, this mom in Millbrae um, was helped to sort of galvanize this community, which was fantastic. And so our site was actually named um, the top online influencer um, in diabetes in 2013 by the American Diabetes Association and ShareCare. Thank you. Thank you. So, Okay, so what exactly is it that we do and how have we started this patient movement? Let me walk you through that a little bit. Um, it's kind of interesting. It actually starts um, in the year 2007 in a dark bar. <laughs> My husband and I went out for a drink and I was fumbling with this kind of clunky glucose meter that I had trying to take a reading and it was so dark and I couldn't see and I'm thinking this thing is so bulky and I pull out my wasabi green iPod and I said, you know, there's such a disconnect here. This is crazy. Look at this wonderful, you know, magical technology that we have just to listen to music. And here I have this thing that my life depends on and it's a piece of crap, you know? So, um, you know, and why can't it be colorful and customizable? And why can't I have a scroll wheel? And why can't I set the alarm to have something other than that ugly beep, you know? So my husband and I started scribbling things on a napkin. This is not the actual napkin, it's a simulated napkin. But <laughs> this is where the idea came from to actually write this open letter to Steve Jobs that was referred to earlier. Um, and this went up on the, um, the day that, they, that Apple had made a big announcement about the 100 millionth iPod being sold. So there was a big sort of news hook right there saying, you know, you're selling hundreds of millions of these things, and yet we, the people whose lives depend on these medical devices, we need you. <laughs> come help us. You know, come get together with the, uh, the medical R&D folks and start you know, infusing that amazing technology into our world. So I, uh, many of you who are here in Silicon Valley will understand the import of this. Michael Arrington picked up this story in TechCrunch, and from there, it just kind of went absolutely berserk viral and um, got a ton of attention 
all sorts of people started coming forward and saying, you know, we've thought that, including the Stanford Biodesign Group, which is how I sort of got involved with them originally, and the folks at IDEO. Um, but it also just led to um, another company coming forward. So we never heard back directly from Apple itself, but there's another um, uh, design firm in San Francisco called Adaptive Path, and they actually reached out to me and said, we have been looking for a really interesting pro bono project. We love your challenge. We would like to help design um, a de diabetes device um, so, sort of for the future, unlike anything that's been done before. Um, so they spent a lot of time with me. They also interviewed hundreds of other people with diabetes, and this is what they came up with, something called the Charmer. And as you can see, it was a little USB stick size excuse me, device that is kind of a combination um, controller for a glucose, continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump all together in one thing with this color touch screen. And the reason it was called the Charmer is it has a little loop on the end, so the idea was that you could wear it on a keychain or on, your, on a necklace, completely different than anything that existed at the time in particular. And they went around with this prototype um, to their sort of circuit of um, user interface and user design um, events around the country, and that also helped. It was kind of like a road show for my cause, because they went around and, you know, displayed this and talked about it to a lot of people, and um, it just started drumming up even more interest, um, and it became sort of the impetus. We realized that we were onto something, so we decided um, why not, and this is, as far as I know, the first time this was ever done, why not launch um, a crowdsourcing competition, an open innovation competition based off the blog, um, just calling for ideas for, you know, prototypes of any kind of new tool that would improve life with diabetes. And so we were very fortunate to get a grant from the California Healthcare Foundation to have $10,000 in prizes, um, which was huge for my little blog at the time. And the IDEO folks were interested. They worked with us. They were on the uh, judging panel. And we did this competition for four years. It was fantastic. We got, we got uh, submissions from all over the country and all over the world, actually. A lot of top universities participating, Northwestern, Pepperdine, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, the list goes on. So, um, you know, it was it was fantastic. I'm just going to show you a, a quick smattering of some of the things that came in. So we had it was interesting. We had a, a combination of things that were just simple, simple fixes like these little bubbles in the bottom, which are actually these sort of single insulin shots that you would take and you just could squeeze it right in, and it's just something you'd throw in your purse. And it's so much more convenient. But then a lot of the other things were very visionary that um, where the science wasn't even quite there yet to make it. But if that's what it could look like, like this armband that would actually deliver insulin and, and test your glucose at the same time, pretty neat. And the thing in the middle was actually our grand prize winner in 2009, um, which at the time, again, was like this sort of, um, you know, out there idea that you would actually utilize the iPhone as sort of the controller for all of this. But now that has actually come to fruition in a number of ways through apps and, and some technologies that plug in to the, um, to the iPhone. So, you know, we really felt like we made a statement. The other exciting thing about this was that a number of the young people who participated um, ended up getting hired by Medtronic and other um, pharma companies in their next generation insulin pump um, departments. So we felt like we'd actually helped place this new generation of thinkers into the industry. So that was very exciting. And again, it helped us launch this sort of national campaign for the, you know, for improved medical devices. So picked up in Business Week, it got picked up in Chicago Tribune. They actually credited us with sort of lighting a fire under the medical industry. Um, and then sort of the next step from there, at that point, um, a lot of organizations were doing these, um, starting to do these, you know, innovation competitions. And we had sort of played that out, so we decided the next thing that we could do that really make a difference was to start bringing together all of the stakeholders in the diabetes care world, with the patients at the center, of course, um, in this sort of intimate environment. So um, for the last four years, been hosting um, the Diabetes Mind Innovation Summit at Stanford. Um, we bring in a group of activated patients, which we find through a Patient Voices contest. Um, it's kind of like a scholarship program. And then we bring in FDA, we bring in clinicians, we bring in all the top pharma companies, and it's like people who are ahead of their global R&D, you know, pretty, pretty high-ranking people who, you know, really want to get plugged into patient sentiments. And, um, and also the big thing for me is connecting the dots between the, the sort of legacy pharma industry and Silicon Valley. So you have all these companies here that are doing this really amazing technology, but they don't necessarily understand the constraints or the sort of history of the pharmaceutical industry, nor do either of those players really understand patients' needs that well. <laughs> so we bring them all together for this event, and it's been fantastic. We're about to do the next one in November. 
And um, I wanted to say that it's not just speakers that come in. We also, um, every year, do some projects to actually call the, the patient voice and patient sentiments. Um, so we usually create a video, and we do some kind of research project. This is the one we did um, in 2013. It was a big um, independent survey. Uh, I worked with USC Annenberg on it. Um, just under 800 people with type 1 diabetes were surveyed about their sentiments about diabetes technology. And we got some really interesting stuff about what the barriers are and, you know, if they don't use it, why not, et cetera. And so we created a report out of this that was given to all of the people who are participating in the event. But the problem still remains. It's kind of um, shocking that in 2015, this is what it still looks like. If you go into many doctor's offices and you want to th them to look at the data on your glucose monitor or on your pump, it's a big mess. It's a cluster. You got all these, um, you know, devices that don't talk to each other. They all have, you know, proprietary cords and whatnot. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, it kind of blows my mind that we're still there. <laughs> I can't even say the words. But there are really two, two problems at work here. One of those is intentional vendor lock-in. Uh, this industry has never had the impetus to, to build open systems, and we're trying to push that agenda. And then you know, sort of related problem is there is no, there's a lack of standards for interoperability for these devices and for the data. And that, of course, is a problem that expands beyond just diabetes data into the health world at large. So we're very involved in, these, in this issue. And in fact, it became so prominent that we decided to um, host a breakout event that we call the Diabetes Mind D Data Exchange, which is um, a second of small, slightly smaller event that we do twice a year now that brings together all the people who are hands-on involved in the algorithms, the apps, the, interop you know, the standards that are being written for interoperability. And we, it, we try to do crossover between the diabetes world and people who are working on the EHR issues. So that's been fantastic, and we're doing that again in November. And there turned out there are a lot of people out there hacking, um, you know, doing a lot of stuff on their own with this with this technology because they can. So the exciting thing is, you know, after doing all this stuff, we realized that we're actually starting to move the needle. Things are happening. Um, so. Uh, Sanofi actually launched their own version of a competition um, called the Diabetes Data Design uh, Diabetes Data Design Innovation Contest, which was a two hundred thousand um, dollar prize contest, and we know that it was modeled after ours because we actually spent a lot of time talking to them about partnering with us. <laughs> then they went and did it on their own, but that was fine. Um, and then Jocelyn Diabetes Center in um, Boston, which is associated with Harvard, considered sort of the leading diabetes uh, clinic in the country. Um, launched their own diabetes innovation event, and theirs is, was this big three-day kind of bonanza where they brought in all of these legislators and, you know, decision makers at the top level from the payer organization. So it's kind of a who's who of, you know, the innovation on a very large national level. So that was fantastic. Um, and JDRF, which uh, many of you may recognize as the other major um, advocacy organization in diabetes care. So it used to be Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Now, in order to encompass adults, they just call it JDRF. Uh, but they started working with Innocentive on a crowdsourcing challenge as well. And that one um, is actually a $100,000 prize. It's um, for developing a new type of insulin. But that was the first open kind of competition they had ever done of the kind. And we know that, you know, again, we spent a lot of time talking with JDRF. They were very supportive of my work. They were always involved in the press releases and helping us get um, people involved in our competition. So we hope that we inspired that as well. Um, and then Medicine X, which is an event that uh, has been taking place at Stanford University for the past couple of years, um, they are one of the few conferences that is very, very um, active in bringing in patients, but they're actually now doing a patient-centered design challenge workshop, which um, I know is modeled after our event because we held the first Diabetes Mind Innovation Summit actually at Medicine X, and people were kind of coming downstairs and saying, wow, this is really cool. I want to be in this design workshop. So. Um, you know, we inspired that. And what's very nice about the Medicine X one is that it's a um, multi-disease state, so they bring in, you know, patients from different diseases working side by side with providers and, and um, designers to kind of work on problem, patient problems, solving patient problems. Um, the other thing that's actually quite big is that patients are now speaking at professional diabetes conferences like the American Diabetes Association annual conference, you know, 15,000 people come together, um, was always super science oriented, never opened the doors to patients at all. I, I was the first patient blogger to ever infiltrate that event and I don't think they liked my first coverage very much because I was so, it was sort of shocking to go to this conference and see this huge expo with all these dancing girls and, you know, they're, they're, they're promoting stuff, you know, and it's like, this is my disease. But 
the good news is that now that, that uh, event, I spoke there this year for the first time, and I've spoken at uh, AADE, the American Association of Diabetes Educators, as well. So they're starting to invite patients to be on panels, to be speakers, to give workshops on social media, um, and they're even having receptions. You know, they're, they're really opening their arms to us, which is wonderful. Um, and then last not least, we've been able to establish this two-way communication with FDA, which is was, I thought, something that was going to be quite impossible, but I was fortunate to get, be able to sort of get in there and invite some of the key people to come out to our events, and they were able to connect with leaders in the patient community, and now have started hosting these town hall webinars that are sort of open to patients. So our colleagues at, a at an organization called Diatribe organized the first one about a year ago, and it was going to be this big conversation between patients and the FDA decision makers so we could kind of get a look behind the curtain on how these coverage decisions are made, you know, or how they uh, evaluate products and, and decide to, um, you know, sign off on them. And so many people signed in for this webinar that we actually crashed the FDA servers. Not just for this webinar, the whole FDA like system apparently went down for a couple of hours, and I mean it was sort of it was disappointing because I was trying to watch it too, and you get it, you got blank. But I think it also sent a very strong message that people really want to be part of, be privy to these conversations. So this continues, the work continues. So why patient-centric design? Let me talk about this for a moment. Um, first of all, I should say that patient-centered and patient-centric are big buzzwords. And when something is a buzzword, it sort of means everything and nothing. So, you know, those terms are sort of hard to define, but the idea of it is that everything emanates from the patient. And, you know, as mentioned earlier, I think it, it still, it definitely still blows my mind that up until a couple of years ago, um, there wasn't this mentality that um, the patient is the end user. The end user was always the clinician. They always went to them with a device or a product and said, is this clinically valid? Yes, but can you live with it? You know, so, um, or is someone going to use it or they're just going to, you know, put it down? And the first, the first continuous glucose monitors that came out were, they sort of worked, but they were also not livable. I mean, the thing was like having a newborn in your bed. It would scream all night, you know, and it was just, so, you know, it's incredibly important, just like in any industry, to start with your customers, right? And I think this also um, goes back to the sort of defining a patient and, and how that has changed. So the word patient obviously originally meant somebody who was sort of suffering and helpless and not able to stand up and speak for themselves and have an active role in their care, right? There was someone who was like laid up in a hospital. But that's thankfully not where most of us are these days. Um, you know, there's this whole new notion of survivorship, you know, a la Lance Armstrong and the, um, the Livestrong group, you know, people who are out there having active lives. And, you know, we want and need to have an active role and decision-making power in our own care. So here's a little, um, <laughs> a little anecdote about what happens when you don't practice uh, patient-centered design. So does anybody know what this is? Anybody recognize this? Yeah, exactly. It was the first inhalable insulin um, from Pfizer, and they were just convinced that it was going to be this big blockbuster because, you know, it's inhalable, right? Woo! Well, um, what comes to mind when you watch? I mean, does it look a little bit like this? It's a little bit like a bong. So you're going to walk into a restaurant, you're going to pull that out, and you're going to go, and no one's going to look at you funny. They're not going to call the authorities. I mean, you know, I, I just you know, nuts. And also, the other thing is, I mean, think about carrying this around. First of all, it was this hospital grade, you know, grade beige, as ugly as, as all get out. And it's huge, you know. We said, what about the poor men who don't have a purse? It's like, are you happy to see me? Or is that just your <laughs> exuber in your pocket, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, not a livable device. And the interesting thing is we also know from the f reporting in the Wall Street Journal that um, the, Pfizer did not include any patients in the you know, design or conceptualization of this. And the few doctors that they did speak to who you know, expressed reservations and said this may be difficult to teach, it might be a little difficult for patients, they were just summarily ignored. So it ended up being a $2.8 billion flop, um, the most expensive to date in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. Pretty sad. But I'm happy to tell you that just a few months ago, the next generation inhalable insulin uh, called Afresia was um, brought to market by Sanofi and Mankind, and it looks quite different, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's this tiny, they spent, you know, in contrast, they spent a ton of time talking to patients and refining their little inhaler, which they call the Dreamboat device, into this little thing, and these color-coded um, cartridges to make it easy to dose, and I, I've been using it myself, and I wanted to show you that, you know, it fits in my little Kate Spade bag. It makes me so happy, you know, <laughs> right? Okay, so, so, you know, quite the difference. 
So this is when I go out to all of these events and I talk to people, I, d I just, I have to remind them that patients are, you know, just, they always talk about patients like these other beings. They're just like you and me. They have busy lives. They have kids. They have financial responsibilities. They have, you know, social difficulties. And, you know, we're out there doing active things and having to stop and take this thing out. I mean, it's, it's a burden. So help us reduce the burden, right? So design for life and think outside the clinic. And, you know, we need well-designed solutions and we need access to the data that, um, you know, that comes out of these so that we have good information about our own health that we can act on. And speaking about access to data, um, I hope some of you recognize this gentleman, um, E-Patient Dave is, is what he's lovingly called. His name is Dave DeBronckhart, and he really fronted this revolution, this E-Patient revolution, in the sense that, um, well, I'll quickly tell you his story. So he was diagnosed in 2007 with um, terminal cancer. He was told he had 24 weeks to live. And he um, thankfully was able to work with a very uh, forward-thinking doctor, and he got himself involved in a um, clinical trial for a sort of aggressive new medicine and was able to beat the cancer, which is amazing. And on top of that, he decided at some point that he was going to activate his hospital's option to transfer his um, medical data into Google Health when that first came out. And it was quite a process just getting that okay for that, but when he finally did it, he discovered um, these like egregious just omissions and um, uh, errors in his own record. And he was shocked and he realized that it was also based on insurance data rather than on clinical data. So he wrote a blog post about this on his own blog called ePatient Dave and it um, got picked up on the front uh, page of the Boston Globe. And I think within a couple of days, the hospital announced that it would no longer use billing data as a proxy for clinically valid information. And also this post that he wrote went viral. It got picked up in I think 11,000 articles and blog posts within one month. So it really put the spotlight on the, this give me my damn data movement is what he calls it, of you know, that we need access, that we shouldn't be charged to get this data, that, you know, that we should um, you know, have, be able to have the option to, again, to get in there and, and correct errors, et cetera. So you know, it's interesting, we went from that mess to Two years later, Forbes declaring that patient engagement is the blockbuster drug of the century. And I think what they mean by that is that it is now the next standard of care by which um, healthcare professionals' work will be measured. And we're kind of in the midst of a frenzy right now, is what I see, of providers, clinics, industry trying to engage patients. Everybody's like, we got to do this. We just don't know exactly what it is, but we got to do it, right? And, I, you know, I'm here to tell you that if, if, Patient engagement is something you're going, you think you're going to do to people, it's not going to work. It's not something you do to somebody, right? I mean, you need to make it compelling for them to engage your organization for them. There has to be um, a sort of a, so let's put it this way. Patient engagement is not content marketing. It's more of an uh, exchange of information and shared goals. And um, if you want to read a little bit more about this, like Leonard Kish wrote a paper, patient engagement is a strategy, not a tool. Which I think explains quite well that it, you know, what it's all about, and the fact that you know you can put out co um, compelling content if it's compelling enough, people will come and utilize it and be engaged with you. But you, it can't be something you're doing to people. It's something you're offering people. So the message is basically the patients are taking the reins, and you'll see that happening everywhere if you have your periscope up. So there really is an incredible opportunity and also I think an obligation in, in this day and age to recognize and work with patients. And if you're wondering where all these e-patient leaders are, one good place to start would be this list published last year by this leading um, healthcare technology and innovation publication it's called Hit Consultant. So I thought it was really interesting to see that um, they it was a list of 15 influential e-patients and 11 out of 15 of them are women. So yeah, right, I, actually fantastic. I think it really, um, you know, underscores the importance of women in the e-patient community and also the incredible opportunity, again, as, as women as healthcare consumers. I wanted to give you a couple examples really quickly of some of the things women are doing. Um, so this woman, Molly Lindquist, was actually um, diagnosed with breast cancer at age 32. 
she had two small daughters, and she was really concerned that eventually they would be dealing with the same diagnosis. And one of the things she really wanted to be able to do was to direct her donations to specific research projects and be able to follow that. And there was no way to do that. It's such a black hole when you donate to something. And I know that from the diabetes organizations, you know. I think they spend that money on the rides, and then the money goes out. I'm not sure. But <laughs> um, in any case, she um, basically decided that she would create that you know, this a, a business around this and create this opportunity. So she's working on it. Um, it's a nonprofit and they're creating um, an easy way for people to direct donations to um, any specific medical research that's important to them. Um, another example is this woman, Darla Brown, who started something called Intake Me. So she was a very successful um, engineering lead, uh, web engineer in um, Los Angeles and was um, diagnosed with cervical cancer, and was shocked, um, like myself, woman after my own heart, she was shocked to find how little patient involvement there was in designing these medical devices and, and software programs and think, you know offerings for patients. So she is in the midst of creating this um, collaboration platform for patients and doctors. And I wanted to say note that she's actually um, hosting a patients as entrepreneur session at the Stanford MedEx event on September 25th, which is obviously right near here, if anyone's interested in that. You can try to sign up for it. I think there's still spots. Um, and another example I wanted to highlight, this is a really amazing example of patient-led innovation crowdsourcing. Has anyone, right, anyone heard of Night Scout at all? Someone? Yay, someone, someone in here. Okay, so this, this is what happened. Um, the continuous glucose monitor that I was showing you earlier is a fantastic tool. Um, it, but the problem is, especially for the parents of ki kids with type 1 diabetes, you can only see the data on the little receiver, which is always with the patient. So if you have a child with type 1, and they're going to school and they're doing sports, or you want them to be able to go to a, um, you know, a sleepover like another kid, and you, know, you're, you want to know that they're safe, you want to be able to see that data somewhere else. You want to be able to have it beamed somewhere else. And clearly, there's technology for that to happen, but none of, it wasn't being offered. So there were a couple of, we call them D-dads, these diabetes dads around the country, who just decided, you know, we can do this. They, they re basically reverse engineered the protocol on this device and made it possible for the data to be beamed to any device, um, a Pebble watch, an iPhone, an iPad. I even seen some houses where they had it on the big screen TV. So, amazing. So, not only did they do this and collaborate, but they wanted to offer this to other families because it was so helpful. So, they created this Facebook page, which started out with a few hundred people on it and then a few thousand people on it, and now they're up to about 14,000 active members. And this is actually a user group. Like, people are creating their own instruction manuals because it's a do-it-yourself kind of thing, right? So the people, they're creating instruction manuals, they post them, there's like 5,000 pictures posted already showing people how to put it together. Um, you know, it's a, it's a support community, totally amazing. And you know, without social media, this never would have been possible. It's doubtful that these, these dads would have found each other in the first place, but then to be able to spread this across the country and across the world and offer it to other people, I mean, it's truly disruptive. And I think that's super exciting, and it has actually gotten the attention of um, mainstream media. So it was picked up in a Wall Street Journal, among other places. There have been a lot of stories about this. And I think this is you know, a great example of people in the patient community recognizing a need and just taking it on themselves to fill that need, because they can. And I want to give you another example from my world, what we did. So as you all know, I'm sure you love to shop as much as I do. The, one of the big, biggest advantages in this day and age of shopping is that you can go online and you can read user reviews, right? Do these shoes run too big? Are the, do they really look like the manufacturer says they're the best things since sliced bread, but is that really true? Is it flimsy? All of that great information that you cannot get on the most important devices and offerings in your life, which is your diabetes devices and you know, things that are designed for your healthcare. Kind of, kind of shocking. So we decided that we could help fill that need uh, with something that we called the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen. So despite the name, it's not only about food. It's actually a um, kind of uh, crowdsourced video product review hub where we invite patients to do these three to five minute videos, um, you know, evaluating all kinds of products um, that are de either designed for diabetes or that have an impact on diabetes care. And I want to take a minute to show you a video introducing this program. When Amelia was first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it was a whirlwind of emotions and information. The doctors were somewhat informative at first, but we really found that the help came when we found the diabetes community. The other caregivers, parents, and kids and adults living with diabetes, they were the ones that really helped us feel like it was going to be okay.
How do I find others who share my health challenges and understand my daily struggles? How can I make choices about the best tools for managing my diabetes if I can't hear from others like me? User reviews? They seem to be everywhere except in healthcare. We see them on every possible internet shopping site. On everything from the latest smartphone, video games, cameras, pet food, hair products, household cleaners, diapers. You get the picture. What if there was a place where it was easy to find reviews by fellow patients like me? Like me. Like me. And caregivers like me. About the most important products in our lives. Our diabetes tools. We launched the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen, which is a video review hub by and for patients. And the whole idea was to allow people a place where they can go and they can scroll through reviews, they can see what other people's opinions are and share their own voices and hopefully have discussion comments on these products. And the idea is that so much of life and especially diabetes care happens in your kitchen, thus the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen. We found a community uh, around type 1 diabetes right away when Amelia was diagnosed, and that really helped us a lot. I think diabetes is different for everyone who lives with it, so I think the more voices and the more access we have to really understanding what other people who are living with diabetes are seeing and learning, I think the better off everyone whose lives are touched by diabetes will be. Watching product reviews from other patients that have actually utilized these devices makes a huge difference to me. I can watch them step by step, how they walk through things and how they utilize these in their life. I can see the pros and cons much better than if I just had to read a review from a doctor or a CD. Having access to high quality information with actual users who are reviewing products and services allows people with diabetes to be able to uh, interact in one place and actually get high quality information that they're looking for. I think having a channel where you can look at product reviews is really essential to diabetes management because the only time you otherwise are going to hear about these products is from your endocrinologist and those aren't the people who are wearing this equipment. They don't have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not really until the product is in the hands of the user that we really know how they perform or don't perform. And that's the information that's so important. We feel like being able to provide this channel for patient voices is really a leap forward um, for all the stakeholders. Hopefully it's really valuable for patients, it's really valuable for providers, and in particular for industry and designers who are you know, constantly iterating on their products and hopefully they are able to tap into the incredible feedback that they're going to get from the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen. Inventing products or services and, and technology that actually simplifies the process of living with diabetes is the big challenge. And the more that, that product manufacturers can gain feedback and insight from people living with diabetes on a daily basis, the better these products are going to be in the long term and the more simple life will be in the future. It is so revolutionary that we can now connect our patients to this entire community of people who just by the presence of diabetes in their lives really understand so much about each other and I think that that not only is a source of support but it's also a source of incredible information. So much more information that I as the provider or as the individual person living with diabetes could share with anyone. Usually it's everything that we think about in regards to diabetes and not what she thinks about and then I started to realize it's actually her voice. Welcome to the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen, where people who should know review products created to improve life with diabetes. My name is Amelia McIver, and I have had type 1 diabetes for four years. We're really proud of the Diabetes Mind Test Kitchen. We hope to include as many voices as possible. Come check it out. So, I mean, really, at the essence, what we're trying to do here is create this new engagement model for patient-centric design. So it starts with patients, but it's not limited to them. It includes all of the stakeholders. And I think it's our, 
our desires are pretty clear. We want to be seen as partners. We want to have, you know, we want, we, first of all, we want our data, open versus closed systems. We want to be seen as the customers, not just the clinicians. Um, we want a voice in designing the tools. And we want to be able to share our experiences with each other and with um, the, you know, a two-way communication between those who provide these products and services. So I, I would just end with my little list of getting a patient engagement right, what you can do. This is totally subjective, the Amy Tandrich list. I'm sure that there are many iterations on this, but um, just my little five-step process here. So first of all, I mean, it starts with listening, obviously. The days of creating some kind of message or, you know, uh, even a, a pamphlet or a program and just pushing it out there are totally over. Um, it's important to sort of find out who the, you know, the net, where are the networks that are um, relevant to your product or service or your program, uh, who are the top bloggers, the influencers, and just start listening to what it is that they are, what real world concerns they care about. And then from there, engage and find out how to support their work. And when I say engage, I think it's perfectly fine to um, jump in and be part of the conversation online as well, as long as you're transparent and identify yourself as, you know, working with a certain organization so that everybody knows what your agenda is. Um, I think we really want to hear from other players besides just other patients. I mean, we've now in the last years have really created this amazing connection between other patients, which is all well and good, but I think it's time to, again, bring in other stakeholders. And, you know, find out, again, there are, there, I'm not the only one doing these types of things. There are many patients out there who are taking the reins and, and building programs. So maybe in, rather than trying to in, reinvent the wheel, you can find out how to support some of these existing programs. And um, this one seems like a no-brainer, but I have to say that um, many, many times when I talk to people, they say, oh, yeah, my organization's got that down. You know, we, we've got an advisory board and we've got some patients on it. Or we have patients come in once a month and talk to us at lunchtime, which is great. It's a great start, but there's always more to be done. And I think that we're all, this whole patient engagement thing is a work in progress. We're all trying to invent it and figure out what the best practices are. So don't just accept the status quo. Um, and I would say related to that, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, that you're going to have to be champions within your own organization. You may need, may need to go in there and kind of fight the good fight and spread the gospel internally for, hey, we need to do more. We need to be more engaged. We need to understand what's happening in the patient community and how we can work more closely with them. And it also helps us um, to kind of overcome that gap between, again, the sort of powers that be and us in, in the sort of grassroots advocacy world. And um, finally, you know, you've got to pass the so what test. It's got to be something focused. And I can say again from personal experience, I've been invited out to many um, large health organizations that think they need to do a patient thing. And so they will bring a bunch of us in, but there's no focus. So there's no follow-up. It was sort of like, oh, we had a nice talk with them and we got to meet some people in person. But, you, need, you know, it needs to be around, again, some issue that matters to the patient community and there needs to be some meat to it. Um, so I can give you a quick example. Um, I showed you uh, in the beginning uh, the issues with skin um, irritations from these sites. That's one of the sort of icky side effects that nobody ever talks about in diabetes, how, how many times we get infected and we have all these problems. So there's a company that actually makes infusion sets, uh, sets for pumps. Obviously, it's in their interest, but they created this program around um, infusion site awareness um, a couple years ago that was actually really, and, they, and it was basically, they put a package together of information that wasn't available anywhere else. It was really good information about how to do site rotations and how to avoid these infections and irritations and, and also what you can do to treat them. And um, they just sort of offered it to us. And people kind of went crazy over it because it was, it was filled a need. It was something we cared about. And it was done in a way that was not just pushing their product. So I think that's a, a good example. And um, I think I will end on that note. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll be around if anyone wants to talk. I don't, we don't have time for questions, right? Actually, there's a couple questions. Let's definitely take them. OK. Anybody? We have Mike. Yeah, there's Mike here. And then Mike has a question. Okay. <laughs> Yay. OK. Good place to start. How did you structure that innovation summit? That seemed like it really spurred a bunch of other folks to go. And what was the sort of key component that got brought people to the table? Or oh, multiple? thank you. That's a great question. So the first year, um, I was it was all it was sort of had grown out of that um, the design challenge competition. So we just so I was I was working with IDEO. And we said let's do this kind of workshop. 
So it was kind of a design workshop where we said, okay, we're going to bring in, again, patients and then people who actually work on the sort of the marketing and R&D. And I had a really tough time that first year convincing these pharma people, oh, my God, they're going to be in the room with their competitors talking about, you know, designing products. We can't do that. I said, no, 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 we're not going to ask you to give away any IP or to show us how you put your pump together. We just we want to talk about solving problems. And so um, I think that people, it was this, this very active program, and that um, really helped. I mean, one thing is, by that point, I had already been... Um, you know, reporting at Diabetes Mind for eight, seven years or something. So I had this incredible network of people who I talked to all the time for stories. And I said, come, come be part of this thing. <laughs> you know, so, um, and again, I know a lot of people in the Valley who work on medical technology. And it was like, hey, this is a really awesome opportunity to bring together, again, the sort of, you know, the, the, the M-Tech, you know, M-Health designers with people from pharma so you can learn about this. And But then each year what we've done is we... Um, we focus on a, a topic, um, something that we think is sort of the hottest topic or the biggest pain point. So again, the first year was this design workshop. The second year was um, actually open systems, which is which now has morphed into this other conference. But it was we had uh, the keynote speaker was the um, the, the uh, head of the executive director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley. And we had him give kind of this analogy to the IT industry when it, when things were closed and proprietary and how when it broke open and USB became available, how that was a win for everybody. It was like, hello, people, you need to do this in diabetes. So the whole, um, the event was sort of focused around that theme. Um, the uh, other themes that we've done were like delivering on the promise of diabetes technology, where we actually featured um, a uh, panel with payers, and it was all about access. It was about how are these dis coverage decisions made, what can patients do in you know, the appeals process, and that year got pretty heated, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I had some patients yelling at the people on the panel. It was like, whoa, yeah, we need to keep our tempers. And, but it was because these are really meaningful, you know, real world problems that we're having. And we, again, try to structure it so that it's not more than 120, 130 people, so that it's kind of intimate and it's, it's a um, kind of workshop forum atmosphere rather than just speaker after speaker because we want people to talk to each other and we we're trying to facilitate that in, in different ways. We had like some, a lot of interactive stuff. Um, where people go, we said the most valuable thing about it was being able to meet, you know, patients being able to talk to the FDA people and, you know, being able to meet people doing all kinds of stuff. We brought in people like in health gaming and, you know, just a huge variety of stuff. Did I answer your question? I'm, <laughs> I'm just babbling. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you for coming and really appreciate the patient perspective. Um, my name is Lucy, I work for a startup that actually treats chronic tendon disease. So similarly, it's something that affects a lot of people. And granted, I haven't done this a lot, but I did reach out to a blogger and some people that post uh, messages on our Facebook, but I find that actually the I try to reach out to the patients, but they don't necessarily engage with me. So what are some ways that as a company, I can engage with a blogger like yourself and still be genuine and not feel like I'm, I'm pushing my product, but really I just want to get that patient voice? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, as you can imagine, we now get bombarded with all these pitches and, you know, a lot of garbage, especially when it's like National Diabetes Month. Everybody finds some way to start out their email with, you know, diabetes is a huge problem. You know, so many million people. I'm like, I know, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it just, you know, or they'll, you know, the other thing is like prevention. People say, oh, pre preventing diabetes. I'm like, yeah, did you not look at my website? It's for people who already have it. Um, but anyway, so you're right. That is, that's a challenge. Um, and I think, you know, it's all about um, being personable. Like, you know, if someone just sends me, a, you know, unsolicited um, a press release and something that obviously looks like a form letter, I usually delete, delete, delete. But if you send a personal note and say, hey, we work in your field, we have this product that we think is could be interesting. Do you want to have a phone call? Could I walk you through it? Can I, you know, we have some, uh, a slide set. I mean, I do those little briefings. For me, it's part of my journalism job, but also so I know what's going on out there. So, you know, a little bit of a personal touch, I think. And, you know, I would start out by sending a shorter note, not this whole novel about everything, because then people think, oh, this is really just a canned pitch, you know? Um, so, it, you know, it is a bit of a challenge, but I think it's all in your communication style and showing that you maybe know a little bit and care about what that blogger is doing rather than you just pushing your stuff. You know what I mean? So it, maybe there's a story they wrote that you could comment on and say, hey, you know, we thought this was interesting, what you, what you wrote about. Maybe we have something to add to that. Um, you know, really try to, again, make it sort of a, you know, personalize it. You know? 
Anybody else? Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But to, could you speak a little bit to the disconnect that really comes between excitement around technology and how fast a, a consumer products company can develop something and the development path and regulatory process that is required for medical devices and how you manage that when thinking about patient-centric design? Oh, thank you. Another great question. Um, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, also for the FDA, a big challenge. But I think what I've found, especially in the last years is that there's this sort of frenzy around health um, as an opportunity in you know the technology world now. And it's the, the problem is that they can people can make these incredible user interfaces and these little, you know, they have a little avatar that does stuff and oh it's so engaging and all that. But the problem is they haven't taken the time to figure out what it's actually like to live with that illness and what a person really needs. So that's a big disconnect right there. And I don't want to name names, but there was one company that came out with a big bang um, with this really attractive looking app a couple years ago and they actually like had a reception and they brought in a bunch of people with diabetes and we all looked at it and we we're like well it's cute but it does nothing that would help me you know and um, I think they went out of business but um, <laughs> um, so you know that is I think there's thankfully um, you know the technology industry is also waking up to the fact that they do need to understand it better and they also need to understand you know the uh, pipeline of a pharma company obviously is a, is a very slow kind of molasses -y thing and there's you know a lot, they're very risk averse um, and obviously FDA approval although they are trying to they've it, they've created this um, innovation acceleration program in the diabetes world now which is wonderful but it took a very long time for FDA to even get the guidance out for M Health apps and I don't know if any of you saw that when that happened recently but they're sort of trying to parse out what needs to be FDA approved. Um, things that just display data and um, are sort of decision support but not active, you know, active therapy um, don't need to be FDA approved. So that helped um, sort of pave the way for a lot of apps to go, you know, go, go public um, and not have to wait on that. Um, but anything that would, you know, that's considered sort of c more clinical, um, uh, you know, and, that, and that's the problem that the, the FDA is still wrangling with. Um, when you are, if you were to control something from a phone, you know, there's obviously inherent risk there that you, you know, butt dial yourself a ton of insulin or something, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, they're worried about that and they're trying to, you know, <laughs> work it out. So it is, it's a kind of a, it's definitely a work in progress. I think that a lot of it is, is that the awareness is, is actually growing among the technology providers that they do need to plug in more to these regulatory issues and, you know, real patient needs. And on the other side, the pharma industry is also obviously plugging in and it's a really exciting time. I don't know if you guys have been watching the news, but you know, Google's doing all kinds of stuff in diabetes right now. Samsung just announced a big partnership with another diabetes company. Philips is getting involved. We have um, Intel and Apple and Google all coming to our events. Um, so there's this really like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just volcano of, of, of activity right now with these big consumer technology companies getting involved in health and in diabetes in particular. So I think that's really going to push things forward um, in terms of the question you asked, in terms of like moving things along more quickly and having these two parties, you know, meet on common ground. Yeah. Thank you. I, I know everybody here agrees with me that... Um, Every year, for those of us that, who come here every year and hear the patient keynote, it sort of resets us in the way that we think about what we're doing, um, those of us that are in industry. And so thank you, Amy, for spending the time with us. I hope that you're going to be here all day because I can tell you you're going to get bombarded at every break. So we apologize in advance, but it's a loving bombardment. Um, so thank you so much. I thought that it would uh, actually be a nice... Um, thing to bring up to people about uh, something that you may not know about our very first patient keynote uh, from MedTech Vision number one. Um, her name was ba Bray Patrick Lake. And do you guys remember her? Those of you that are here? Okay. For, you, for those of you who don't know, but do remember her, she is now the co-chair of the NIH Precision Medicine Committee. <laughs> So I, I raise that to make the point that the patient keynotes you we're bringing you, you know, are like changing lives in a big way. And so, Amy, you're a great example of that and continuing that legacy. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to take a break. Panel one, do not worry. I am going to give you your time back. Leslie's back there like giving me the stink eye. Um, don't worry. So uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. When you 10 minutes are up, we are going to ring you back in. So please comply or we will come get you uh, and get on with panel one. So thank you guys for a great morning so far.